morning and welcome to Vermont House Judiciary Committee. It is Thursday, January 13th, and we are going to be looking at S30, an act relating to prohibiting possession of firearms within hospital buildings. Uh, this is a bill that passed the Senate and came to our committee last year, and uh, we, did not, um, we did not take it up at that time. And so we are looking at it now. Um, we will have uh, attorney Eric Fitzpatrick walk us through the bill as passed the Senate and that that is uh, posted on our, our website. Um, there is also language that um, representative will not um, uh, will likely propose that at some point, but it is not it is not being proposed at this time. But again, we wanted uh, witnesses to be able to see the language has been posted since I believe Monday night um, that also um, will be under um, today's date as well. And then finally, there's language uh, regarding um, shooting competitions that uh, was in a, um, a bill that had um, passed the legislature, um, but was part of a larger bill that was vetoed. And I know that there is interest in that language as well. And so that is posted under my name um, on our committee website um, for people to, to look at. And then we have um, a number of witnesses. Um, there are some witnesses from the West Coast who we will be, um, witness from the West Coast and then a physician who will be uh, fitting in at specific times this morning. So I appreciate your, your flexibility as we um, make sure we hear from folks. And then um, uh, Eric Davis, who was scheduled for today um, is unavailable, but, um, but Mr. Davis will be able to join us um, next week, I'm hoping on um, Thursday morning um, at nine o'clock so we can make sure that we get him in um, when we start. So with that, um, good morning, uh, Eric, thank you. Yes, good morning, thank you. And good morning to everybody. This is uh, Eric Fitzpatrick with the Office of Legislative Council here to do a walkthrough for the committee of uh, S30 and act relating to prohibiting possession of firearms within hospital buildings. As, as that act passed the, ha passed the Senate, sorry. And uh, the version that you have on the website is the version that passed the Senate. And my plan would be to pull the language up and take a look at it, share the screen first, if that's okay with you, Chair Grad. Absolutely, thank you. Great, right, sure. And actually, uh, before, uh, well, I'll pull up a couple of documents, but I wanted to mention by way of background that, that S30, the prohibition on firearms in hospital buildings is a type of firearms regulation that's known as a location restriction. So you'd sort of think about the different types of firearms regulations that Vermont has on the books. Some address, uh, you know, what, what uh, groups of folks can possess them. Some address uh, what types of firearms may be, may be possessed, what types of firearms are prohibited. This doesn't uh, approach it from that angle. This is a location restriction. So it, it prohibits firearms on the basis of the location uh, in which they are uh, possessed. And in fact, and this is what I want to actually pull up first, uh, in fact, Vermont has two location restrictions already. And we'll take a quick look at those because they are helpful for understanding where the language uh, in, um, in uh, S30 came from. So I'm going to pull up um, what we have on the books right now. First, with respect to, and this is in Title 13, the same chapter that the proposal is to put this uh, provision on firearms, uh, sorry, on hospitals in. You have this existing uh, section of law on prohibition of possessing firearms uh, in school buildings on a school bus or on school property. So this is existing law, it has been for a number of years. You'll see the provision in subsection A provides that a person can't, it's prohibited from knowingly possessing a firearm or a dangerous or deadly weapon while within, see that's an important word, within the school building or on a school bus. And this is a one year felony, $1,000 you see in the first sentence there. Uh, it also, uh, there's what was a sort of bifurcation adopted when this statute was passed. So you see that, that the second provision subsection B, not really relevant, but interesting to understand is that uh, also it prohibits possessing a firearm or dangerous or deadly weapon on school property, but in those situations, it's only with the intent to injure another person. So in other words, if, if you, you can't possess a firearm at all within a building or on a bus, 
but as far as uh, on other school grounds, it's okay to have it as long as you don't intend to injure another person with it. So that's obviously to cover the situation where someone may have a, a firearm in a vehicle when they go to pick a kid up from school, or maybe they have one in the vehicle because they're going hunting afterwards, whatever. You don't want to uh, inadvertently sweep in that kind of conduct. So as long as you have it, uh, but aren't intending to injure another person, it's okay to have it on school grounds. Um, you'll Eric, see that, uh, yes, please. Yeah, yeah. on the school grounds thing, just one thing crossed my mind. What if somebody uh, was, was open or concealed carry, I guess, at a sporting event, say at, at a football game, it's outside on the school grounds, not inside? Yeah, as long as you're not intending to injure somebody, that's fine. Okay. That's what I thought. Okay. Yep. Um, uh, and you have these standard exceptions, which you've seen before for law enforcement officers and, and uh, those sorts of things. Um, so uh, the next provision I want to take a quick look at has to do with courthouses. That's the other location restriction that Vermont has on the books. So we have two, schools and courthouses. And this one, similarly to the one we just looked at, uh, subsection B, uh, it's the, the prohibition is you can't. Uh, while within a courthouse, again, you have that within language, while within a courthouse or without authorization from the court, you can't carry or have your, in your possession a firearm, and you can't knowingly carry uh, any other dangerous or deadly weapon. And this one is a one-year misdemeanor as well. So they're both one-year misdemeanors. This one is a $500 fine rather than a $1,000 fine. I'm not sure why that is. We'll have to wait for the criminal classification bill to address those sorts of things. But uh, uh, you'll see the Subsection C also is there's a notice provision in this one. So uh, notice that the that firearms are prohibited in courthouses has to be posted conspicuously at each public entrance. So that's a little bit of background and you'll see very similar language to that when we look at S30 and the proposal in S30 is essentially to add a third location to the location restriction that Vermont has on the books so to add hospital buildings. And I'll stick over this language because that's what was not in the bill as passed the Senate. The language that passed the Senate begins on page two in the red italics. And you'll see, similarly to what we were just looking at for uh, schools and courthouses, it's a possession uh, in a building that is prohibited. So subsection A, person shall not knowingly possess a firearm while within a hospital building. So in other words, it doesn't include the grounds, whether it be parking lot or the, the uh, property outside the building is not, it's not uh, subject to the prohibition. It's only in the, within the building where the firearm is prohibited. Again, it's a one year misdemeanor. You see that's similar to, or actually the same as the penalty for uh, the courthouses and schools. It does use the $1,000 fine, which is uh, the one that uh, was for schools rather than the $500 one for courthouses, uh, but that's, Actually, one year, thousand dollars is standard for the, the firearms offenses that have been passed over the last few years. Uh, you'll see an exception that similar to what we had just seen. There's section subsection C doesn't apply to law enforcement, so federal or state law enforcement officers are not subject to this prohibition, so they can uh, continue to possess their firearms in hospital buildings. You'll see subsection D is the notice provision similar to the one that we just saw with respect to courthouses. So notice of the provisions has to be posted conspicuous, conspicuously at each public entrance. So in other words, at each public entrance, there has to be some notice that firearms are prohibited within this building, something of that nature. And the definitions also similar to the firearm definition is that's the, the same definition language that it cross references uh, 4017D, which is the felon in possession statute, the one that prohibits uh, people who have been convicted of certain crimes from possessing firearms. And that's the uh, firearm definition that you've used consistently over the most recent years. Uh, it, it excludes uh, antique firearms, black powder, muzzle loaders, that sort of thing. So those kind of firearms are actually not subject to the prohibition. Uh, and lastly, definition of hospital. Uh, that's the that definition comes from the uh, licensing statute, the Vermont licensing statute for hospitals. Um, I'll read it to you just just for uh, it's commonly used, but just so you're aware of the language. It's defined as a place devoted primarily to the maintenance and operation of diagnostic and therapeutic facilities 
for inpatient medical or surgical care of individuals who have an illness, disease, injury, or physical disability, or for obstetrics. So that's the licensing definition of a hospital. Uh, next, so that's the end of the section on the, on the hospital prohibition, the first section of the bill. The second section is a, a, uh, a study that's directed to be done by the Capital Complex Security Advisory Committee. That's an existing committee that studies, um, I expect from the name of it, <laughs> security at the State House in the, in the Capital Complex section, which is larger than the State House. It's a whole region of, of uh, the State House area. Uh, but what the, the proposed language does is it charges the, um, the study committee with taking a look at uh, the issue of regulating firearms in the Capitol complex. You see, that's uh, the third line of the first uh, paragraph. So they have to, uh, I see the date obviously would have to be changed assuming if this were to move forward, it was passed the Senate last year. So it still has last year's uh, date in it. Uh, but uh, otherwise it's uh, fairly direct, ask the, the security advisory committee to look at uh, how the possession of firearms in the Capitol complex is regulated currently including uh, under Rule 26, uh, which does uh, prohibit firearms in the state house uh, of the joint rules, describe situations when persons have impermissibly possessed firearms at the Capitol complex and how they've been typically handled and recommend whether this issue should be addressed in legislation. You know, the idea being, is the rule sufficient uh, or is legislation needed? That's the issue to the study. And uh, that's the end of the walkthrough of S30. So um, I could pull the screen down if you want Representative Grad or, or just pause for a moment, whichever is your preference. Sure, let's, let's pause. And I'm looking to see if uh, committee members have questions. I don't see any, but also with screen sharing, sometimes it's difficult. So um, right. okay. Tom, there you go, thank it, thanks. But if I miss any committee members, please uh, uh, just uh, ask your question, but go ahead, Tom. Great, thank you, Eric. Uh, You'd mentioned earlier with, uh, I think it's the existing law that uh, signs have to be posted conspicuously. Right. Um, is there a definition of conspicuously? Because what went through my mind is at the, uh, um, well, what I call the, the, the junior high school that I, that I went to in Rutland, um, the basketball team still plays down there, you know, their games, but the high school basketball but uh, there's, gosh, there's got to be eight doors uh, across the front of that building as the entrance goes. Now, I, I, if, if a sign is posted way over to the left, um, you know, it, it may cover the, the definition of conspicuously. But if somebody enters way over to the right, um, it's not so conspicuous. So I, I guess I'm just wondering what the definition is, if, if we even have one. Yeah, that's a good question, uh, Representative Burdett. The uh, There is no definition currently, so it's sort of a plain language approach. It's subject to some discretion, um, but it's certainly worth thinking about uh, that, uh, it, you know, whether or not you think that that term uh, is enough on its face to give folks enough direction as to where the signs need to be posted or whether you need to, uh, you know, add a little more detail and provide a definition. There isn't one currently, but it's a, it's a um, good question to raise. Yeah, and, and I don't know if maybe at some point during the year or during the uh, uh, um, during the past, I, I don't know if maybe it's been a, a topic in a, in a court case, if, it, if there's uh, um, any court cases that had discussed it and maybe kind of defined it. Yeah, I'll take a look. It's a good question. Thank you. You bet. Great. Thank you. Uh, Eric. Eric. Yes. Um, there probably is uh, some related cases uh, regarding that uh, in school cases uh, because of the uh, um, the no firearms on school property. Uh, and so there probably are some similar language uh, configurations in that. Yes, thanks for that suggestion, Representative Christie. I, I had the same thought, so uh, um, uh, we were we were going in the right direction on that one. Thank you. <laughs> that's scary. <laughs> yeah, that's right. 
Any other uh, committee members? Again, it's hard for me to like, see everybody. Nope. Okay. Great. So let's now turn to language that um, that Representative Not would like us to look at. And uh, well, I'm not sure. Did you want to say anything at, at this point, or or go ahead with the with the walkthrough? Um, well, I'll just speak uh, briefly. Uh, so you know what what we what we have here in, in this amendment is. Uh, Nothing that is new to this committee. Um, I'm looking at uh, the year ahead of us, and of course, um, anything that that doesn't uh, pass this year, anything that isn't addressed, just you know, goes up in a puff of smoke, and we have to start from scratch um, at the uh, start of the next biennium. And there were a few things uh, in regards to uh, firearms that that I thought was important to uh, make certain that. Um, we did talk about and we did address. And, and, and one of them is the Charleston loophole, which is covered in, in this proposed amendment. And um, for those of you who, who aren't aware, um, what most of this committee uh, previously had the opportunity to discuss this, um, you know, uh, the Charleston loophole is, is unfortunately named after a shooting that took place where the, the perpetrator should not have had a firearm. He shouldn't have passed a background check test. And the background check um, is currently in the state of Vermont as it was where he got his firearm. Um, if it isn't completed in the first three days, then um, the person can purchase their firearm. As, uh, so if your background check runs longer than three days, uh, the, the outcome almost doesn't matter. You can walk out with a firearm. And um, in, the, in the state of Vermont over the last couple of years, 97% roughly of background checks have passed uh, in three in three days. Uh, people have been all set. Um, it's a very small amount we're talking about, but in that in that small amount over the last couple of years, um, there have been 28 retrievals in, issued where someone got their firearm after three days, even though the background check wasn't completed, and uh, they were able to, to take the gun and uh, take a firearm they shouldn't have. And I think that puts law enforcement in a, in a very dangerous situation because they have to go out and retrieve these firearms. And actually of the, of the 28 retrievals, uh, only 19 are complete, which means um, there are currently uh, nine firearms that were sold to people who should not have had them over the last couple of years that, that are unaccounted for. And, and in a state the size of Vermont, I mean, nine is a large number. I, I find that to be very chilling. So, so I wanted uh, this committee to take another look at closing the Charleston loophole, at making certain that instances where people are walking out the doors with a firearm that they should not legally have been able to purchase, uh, I, I think we should do what we can to, to stop that for public safety, for law enforcement safety, for, for a number of reasons. Um, the the, the uh, amendment also includes a provision that, that we had discussed before, which allows uh, public health um, or health healthcare providers to share concerns with law enforcement. Um, quite often, you know, our, our, our law enforcement does a great job. They can't be everywhere. And one place they often are not is in a hospital room. And we need to create circumstances where if a healthcare professional in treating a patient has concerns that that patient could be a danger to themselves or to their family or to the general public, uh, and that person they, is in possession of a firearm, that a healthcare professional can speak to law enforcement and share those concerns with law enforcement without uh, you know, creating a, a legal professional violation of, of, their, of their code as a healthcare provider. Um, at, at times, I think that the bond between, say, doctor and patient you know, that, that needs to be split a little bit when the public good or when the safety of family members is at risk. So this would allow for, um, the amendment uh, would allow for healthcare um, professionals to stop, talk to law enforcement, to make certain that concerns they have about someone who may harm themselves or others with a firearm can be properly addressed and doesn't have to be bottled up 
and confidentiality. And there's also at the end, there's also a annual report in regards to um, the use of uh, risk protection orders. And uh, that is just uh, something that, that, again, it had been uh, talked about before. It's data that we, we need, as, as we know as a committee, we are frequently talking about the need for data to, to, to base our decisions on. Um, the, the lack of data is often a hindrance in creating good policy. So this was something that we had looked into before. It's information that I think could be very helpful to us in, in future discussions. And so that is included in the uh, proposed amendment as well. So yeah, so I'm not making an official motion at this time. I'm not um, putting this on the, on the table for a vote, but I, I thought these were all important things that were at least tangentially related to the subject matter of S30. So I thought this would be a good time to have this conversation through a potential amendment because uh, quite frankly, whatever the committee decides, I would hate for us to walk out the doors at the end of the session without discussing these things. I think it's important. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. And um, so, so Eric, if you can please walk us through um, the amendment and um, and there's, there is some language that um, in S30 that's not in the amendment. <coughs> Also, um, I believe that some of this language is from a bill that is in the Senate uh, S5, but it is also language that passed um, that passed the legislature in a bill that was vetoed, and that is uh, so. Again, is is language that is familiar to us. So, if you if you could um, put the language in, in um, sort of historical context, I think that'd be very very helpful. Thank you. Sure. Um... Can everyone still see my screen? I just had a message popped up that suggested maybe I might not still be screen sharing. So I just want to make sure everyone can still see Representative Knott's There's, amendment. I don't have any screen yeah. sharing. Eric. You're still co-host. You can pull it back up. Okay. Let me try that. I go back into Zoom perhaps and pull it back up. Uh, All right, that seems to have worked. Thanks, Amber. Um, all right. Uh, how about now? Is that working? Yes. Okay, great. Thank you. All right. So, uh, as Representative not uh, explain uh, his amendment, and I'll give a little bit of the walkthrough of the of the language that uh, that is proposed. You'll see, actually, section one actually just includes the firearms prohibition that I already went through. So this section is unchanged from S30 as it as it passed the Senate. Eric, uh, is this the draft that's underneath Will's name? Yes. Okay, great, thank you. Yep. Uh, so yeah, section one's the same as S30. Uh, section two is the um, the background check issue that Representative Nutt was was discussing. Now this language uh, for purposes of, of context as uh, Representative Grad was getting at, this language uh, I believe passed the House uh, two years ago in H610. So this committee looked at it at that time. I know not everybody on the committee is the same as the members who looked at it then, but some folks probably remember it. So it, uh, I believe it was not taken up in the Senate. Um, or maybe I'm even misremembering that. It may have passed this committee, but never reached the House floor. I think that may have been the history of it. Um, so it came out of committee, but didn't pass. Um, in any event, it was not uh, taken up in the Senate for either one of those reasons, but this committee has looked at uh, the issue before. So, so the issue is what section two deals with is a, is a different provision of law that uh, exists right now. You see 13 BSA 4019. And, and the issue here is background checks. Uh, under federal law, uh, uh, background checks must be conducted on anyone who wants to purchase a firearm from a what's known as a federally licensed firearms dealer, an FFL, a federal firearms licensee. So uh, anytime a person wants to uh, buy firearms from an FFL, a background check has to be conducted. Now, in 2018, the section of Vermont law that you're looking at right now, 13 BSA 4019, that was passed uh, by the legislature in 2018, and this required background checks on firearm sales between private persons. So they weren't, the, the, 
those sales are not covered by the federal background check requirement. This was uh, an, an extension of that requirement uh, to private sales. Uh, in other words, those not uh, when firearm is not sold by a, a licensed firearm dealer. Now, there were some exceptions for immediate family members, law enforcement, folks like that. Uh, but generally speaking, um, it applied to, to private sales. Now, under, under both of these types of background check, uh, whether it's a sale by the FFL or a private sale, the background check itself actually is conducted by the federally licensed firearms dealer. In a private sale, you see the language um, uh, right at the bottom there. The, in, in the private sale situation, the two folks who are involved in the sale, the proposed transferor and the proposed transferee have to go together to the FFL, to the firearms dealer, and have asked that the dealer uh, facilitate the transfer. And that's how that works. So the, uh, the procedure, uh, whether it's through a private sale or whether it's a sale from the FFL, is that the, once the uh, sale is proposed, the proposed purchaser, pur purchaser sorry, has to fill out uh, a form, uh, providing some personal details, they have to show their ID, and then the, um, the firearms dealer contacts the National Instant Criminal Background Check System, NICS, N-I-C-S. And they can contact NICS by telephone or by an online, an online system known as the e-check system, but they have to contact NICS in order to determine if this person who's proposing to buy a firearm is prohibited or not. So NICS checks its databases and uh, to see if uh, the person who's proposing to buy the firearm is prohibited by either state or federal law. Now, if they're not, so if there's no prohibition comes up when they check their databases, then they assign what's known as un a unique identification number to the transfer. And they give that number to the, to the dealer and the transfer can proceed. So assuming that there's no, no red flags, so to speak, that come up and show that the person is prohibited for one reason or another from possessing a firearm, then they give the, they give the transfer a number and the, and the transfer can proceed. Now, this brings us to that's the sort of the background of how the process works. And it brings us to um, the proposed language in section two. And to, to sort of understand that, it's important to remember uh, or to understand the other point that reps have not made, that uh, if under federal law, if Nix is not able to provide that unique identification number, remember I mentioned they have to give that number back if they find that the person's not prohibited. But if they're not able to do that within three days, then the transfer can still proceed. That's what's known as uh, a default proceed, a legal perspective on that, that sometimes, as Representative not said, some folks refer to it as the Charleston loophole. From a legal perspective, it's known as the default proceed, because the default is that, um, sorry, I was going to go back up and take a quick look, and so you can see this language. It's uh, um, worth looking at the language itself, and that is um, in federal law, you'll see but that is down in I believe it's subsection T. This is a lengthy statute, but let's just take a peek at the language so you can see it. Um, it is helpful. There we are. So, um, sorry, the... Uh, this is the, the federal language that describes the process that uh, I just went through with the committee. So that uh, um, you see it sort of starts in subdivision one there and a little bit halfway through that paragraph. Licensed importer, licensed manufacturer, or licensed dealer shall not transfer a firearm to any other person who is not licensed under this chapter unless, first of all, before the completion of the transfer, licensee contacts the national uh, instant criminal background check system, which we just described. So first they have to contact NICS. And then what happens? The system provides the licensee with a unique identification number or three business days, meaning a day on which state offices are open, have elapsed since the licensee contacted the system and the system has not notified the licensee that the receipt of a firearm by the other person would violate subsection GRN. In other words, that, that um, somehow the person is possessed, or sorry, prohibited uh, by state or federal law from possessing a firearm. So that three days have elapsed and they don't, the system NICS doesn't get back to the person, to the FFL with a unique identification number, then the transfer can proceed. And that's what's known as the default proceed. Um, 
So to address that uh, situation, so I got a lot of documents up here, so let's see if we can find the right one. No, no, no. Yes. <laughs> the, uh, the proposal in S30 addresses that uh, default proceed by extending that three day period to 30 days. You see, so what it provides is that person shall not transfer a firearm to another person if the transfer requires a background check under this section or federal law. So if the transfer is one that for which a background check is required, um, then the licensed dealer who facilitates the transfer, if they haven't been provided with that unique identification number, then the, uh, then the transfer cannot proceed, provided that if that identification number has not been provided within 30 days, then the transfer may proceed. So you see, essentially, it's still a default proceed. It's still, um, you know, if, if the answer, if the unique identification number is not provided within a certain period of time, the transfer can still proceed. It's just that uh, it's not three days anymore. It would be a 30 day situation for purposes of transfers in Vermont. So that's the proposal uh, regarding background checks and Representative Knott's amendment. So I'm going to skip to the next section. I'm, pa I'm sort of pausing in case there's any questions or we can save questions for the end, whichever uh, folks prefer. Yeah, so the you, next, sorry, go ahead. I was going to say, yeah, why don't you go, um, why don't you keep walking through, please? Thanks. Yeah, definitely. Uh, so the next section, section three, has to do with Vermont's uh, ERPO law, which also passed in 2018, uh, the same same bill as the same act as the um, the uh, background check provision we were just looking at. Uh, now, ERPO, uh, the, the, and this is, sorry, not the section of, of, not the proposal didn't pass in 2018. What I mean is the ERPO law itself. The Vermont, that's when Vermont put the ERPO law in the books. And ERPO stands for Extreme Risk Protection Order. And that's that statute basically permits the attorney general or state's attorney to obtain a court order that prohibits a person from possessing a dangerous weapon. If the court finds that by clear and convincing evidence uh, that the person pos uh, poses an extreme risk of causing harm to themselves or another person by possessing or purchasing a dangerous weapon. Now that's an exact quote from the statute. And you'll see that I wanted to use that exact language because that's important for purposes of this proposed amendment. But uh, uh, the ERPO, statute was put on the books and uh, or was passed in 2018. And this provision of law is an amendment to the ERPO procedure. And this amendment that you see, this language you see uh, was in S-169, which was a bill that was vetoed by the governor a couple of years ago. Uh, so this language as well has also been seen by, by uh, uh, the House Judiciary Committee, or at least some members of it a couple of years back before uh, the bill was vetoed. Now, the proposal that it makes to, um, to change the ERPO statute has to do, as Representative Knott mentioned, with health care providers. And uh, it has to do with a, a situation that came up because evidently uh, health care providers were concerned uh, that they could not provide law enforcement officers with relevant information without violating HIPAA. HIPAA being the Federal Healthcare Privacy Act, which protects the privacy of people's healthcare information. And that HIPAA statute generally, um, generally prohibits disclosure of a person's healthcare information by providers. So generally speaking, uh, it prohibits that kind of disclosure. However, as with uh, most statutes, there are exceptions, there are exemptions, and I'm going to uh, bring up one of them right now so that you can see the language. Um, let's go back to this and we'll look at the Code of Federal Regulations, which, um, which provides where these exemptions are from the, from the HIPAA disclosure prohibition. And that's in subsection J. Let's find that down here. So there's the, these are all uh, exemptions to the general prohibition on disclosure of protected health information under HIPAA. And we're looking in particular at one of them, which has to do with uh, the type of situation that um, 
healthcare providers were concerned about, which led to um, led to the language that you're looking at right now. So subsection J. These are this is an exception to to the general prohibition on disclosure of protected health information by healthcare providers, covered entities. And the uh, exception applies, you see, under subsection one there, covered entity may, consistent with applicable law and standards of ethical conduct, use or disclose protected health information. That's known as PHI, that's, that's generally prohibited from being disclosed. If the covered entity, in good faith, believes the use or disclosure the 1A there and B are the ones we're focusing on, is necessary to prevent or lessen a serious and imminent threat to the health or safety of a person or to the public. And its dis dis disclosure is made, and this is to who it's made, is to a person or persons reasonably able to prevent or lessen the threat, including the target of the threat. So this is an exemption. If the healthcare provider thinks that this disclosure is necessary to prevent or lessen a serious or imminent threat, and they give it to some provide the info to somebody who could prevent that threat, then there's an exception. So uh, there, as you might think from reading that language, that well, isn't that, that sort of uh, the same idea that the ERPO statute is getting? Remember the language I read in the beginning is very similar to that. Not exactly, not identical, but conceptually, you're looking at a dangerous situation, an imminent dangerous situation. So what, uh, um, what uh, the proposal does in the language that we're looking at. And let me see if I can, I'm gonna have a hard time finding it again. Here we are. Um, addresses that situation through a, essentially uh, a definition. It defines the, um, the ERPO standard to uh, include the language that we just read from the HIPAA standard. So what it provides is under subsection D1, says for purposes of petition filed pursuant to this chapter, this is an ERPO petition, uh, someone uh, asserting that uh, the person is a danger to themselves or others for the use of a firearm. Now, when a petition like that is filed, a healthcare provider may notify a law enforcement officer when the provider believes in good faith, see this language should be familiar because we just looked at it, it's in the HIPAA statute, when the provider believes in good faith that disclosure uh, is necessary to prevent or lessen a serious and imminent threat to the health or safety of a person or the public. So that's the exact language from the HIPAA exemption. It basically takes the language from the HIPAA exemption, puts it right in Vermont statute. So it's 100% clear that that is a permissible uh, disclosure of information by the healthcare provider. And then uh, closes the loop in subdivision B by saying, not only that, but when we use that language necessary to prevent or lessen a serious and imminent threat, et cetera, include circumstances when the healthcare provider reasonably believes that the patient poses an extreme risk of causing harm to themselves or others through the use of a dangerous weapon. So that's the ERPO standard. So it's a bit of uh, uh, definitional drafting uh, connection to close that loop and make clear so that uh, healthcare providers uh, can provide, can disclose this information to law enforcement officers without being concerned that doing so would violate uh, their obligations under HIPAA. Excuse me, Eric. So. Um... So I just want, so this language is really, it's clarifying language. It's not adding healthcare providers as, as um, another entity that can petition um, for a, um, um, for extreme risk protection order. Correct? Because I, I, I. Yes, I that's right. Yeah, yeah. They, they can't file the petition themselves. They can just uh, uh, provide some information to a law enforcement officer. Um, and also, actually, law enforcement officers can't file the petition either. It has to be a state's attorney or attorney general. But the, but the LEO, the law enforcement officer, is permitted by statute to let the court know that uh, an ERPO petition is being filed. But no, it doesn't change that procedure at all. So it's not expanding our current procedure. It's, it's clarifying that there would not be a, a HIPAA violation. Exactly, right. Thank you. Yep. Uh, section four is, was a reporting requirement that also was included. Oh, I'm sorry, I forgot to mention, as you, as you uh, pointed out, Representative Grad, not only was this language in S-169 uh, as vetoed by the governor, it's also in a bill that's in Senate Judiciary right now that was introduced this year, S-5. So it's also uh, in a bill that's currently on the wall uh, down in Senate Judiciary. Uh, the, uh, and that bill, as well as S-169, included this reporting requirement section which requires the court administrator to, to annually 
report to the Judiciary Committee's uh, data on the use of ERPOs. And this data will include uh, several things that you see on the next page. It's the number of you know, ERPO petitions that have been re requested and issued, where they were filed, um, whether they were renewed or terminated and whether, whether the subject of the petition ever violated it. Um, there's also a provision in subsection C that requires the Agency of Human Services uh, to include an analysis of ERPO on, on suicide rates. So I remember one of the purposes of ERPO was to um, have a uh, impact on suicide rates. So the task, the report, AHS is tasked here with also including in the report an analysis of whether that impact uh, actually occurred. Um, and there's an effective date of July 1st, 2022, which I think is the same as S30. Uh, and that brings us to the end of the walkthrough. Thank you, Eric. And then what is not in this amendment is the um, study regarding um, firearms in the state house. Yes, that's right. Thanks for that reminder. That's right. So this amendment doesn't include the, the piece of S30 that required the Capital Complex uh, Advisory Committee to look at uh, uh, firearms in the State House complex. Can I jump in? Sure. Thank you. Um, when uh, Representative Knott was given his walkthrough, he said there was nine firearms that still weren't accounted for, I believe, out of out of 26 or something like that. Is Eric, is there a law? Is there something that says that um, um, that the, the, the nine firearms that are missing, the people that purchase them, is there a law that says that they're fine, they're in jail, there's there's some sort of consequence for not coming up with a firearm? Uh, if the person is, uh, again, I don't know the facts of those particular cases, but, but if, if sort of hypothetically, some of those folks or all of those folks would have been prohibited or, or are, if the reason that they, they um, should not have obtained the firearm is because they they are prohibited by law from possessing it. Like let's say just a couple of examples. You know, perhaps the person um, had been subject to involuntary inpatient mental health treatment. They've been confined to a mental health facility. Or let's say the person had been convicted of a of a certain felony that disqualifies them from possessing a firearm under state or federal law. If that if that that was true, then yes, there would be a law that prohibited that person from possessing a firearm. So we don't know if those, we, we don't know um, if if the people that broke the law, we, we, we don't know if they're been reprimanded. We don't know anything about them. Uh, not that I know of. There may be others who would have more information on that, but I, I'm not aware of anything, nope. Okay, thank you. Sure. And uh, Eric, in terms of the, the 30 days. Um, can you tell us a little bit about um, if other states use 30 days, if there are um, other time frames, um, have there been court decisions on that? You know, I, that's something I'd have to look into. I, that's not something that I'm, I'm aware of off the top of my head. Okay. All right. Yeah. If you could check that out, because I, 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 I think there are states that have different, I think I've heard 10 days, 30 days, I'm not sure, but that, that'd be good to, um, to find that out, please. Okay, so. No, there, there are, I agree, yeah, there are definitely other time periods used in other states. I'm just not sure exactly what they're, but I, I, I do recall that too. There are other state statutes that use different time periods. Um, to get the specifics of that though, I'll, I'll take a look. Okay, great. Sure. Okay, okay. so I do see some hands. Can I, um, I um, is your hand up from before or do you have another? question. Well, yeah, I, I never really uh, finished um, All right. my, my whole thought for, so um, you, and now you brought up another one. These other states that are waiting for 30 days, if I'm being threatened and I need uh, something to protect myself with, 
Are, have these other states, uh, have they enacted something that allows protection for me? Uh, I don't know about other states, but actually that's one of the exceptions that we have in the Vermont, uh, the Vermont background check uh, statute has an exception for, and I'm looking for the exact language. It's an, it's an emergency situation. Um, and um, I can pull, if you give me a moment, then I can, pull that up so I can read you the language. I don't, I'm not having it right now, but if you give me just a few seconds, I should be able to read that to you. I appreciate that. Yeah, sure. All right, we're just about there. Okay, so the exception in the Vermont statute is, I'll read it to you. Uh, I mentioned it doesn't apply to you know, law enforcement uh, agency transfers or transfers between immediate family. Uh, and then there's one other exception, which is doesn't apply to a person who transfers the firearm to another person in order to prevent imminent harm to any person, provided that this subdivision shall only apply while the risk of imminent harm exists. So while there's an imminent harm uh, provision, um, I mean, while the imminent harm exists, sorry, uh, then the uh, uh, the exception applies. But once there's no longer no more imminent harm, then um, then it would sort of go away. So, who determines imminent harm? Be besides a person that's worried that they're going to be harmed, who who else would do that? Yeah, that's a fair point. Uh, I think the I think you're right. It's probably going to be based on the individual circumstances. In the first instance, it's going to be the person who is subject to imminent harm who's probably going to be making a, a call under the exigent circumstances that exist. And then if if for some reason someone later on said, well, that there wasn't really imminent harm, maybe they could they could, you know, they would have to be a situation where um, it's sort of thinking out loud, but the only way that someone might challenge that, I suppose they could say, well, there wasn't really imminent harm and because this is a, it was a crime if they don't get the background check when required, it's a one year misdemeanor. Someone I suppose could report it to the state's attorney and uh, say, hey, this person transferred a firearm to another person and they claimed there was imminent harm and there really wasn't. I want you to look into that. Um, would that ever really happen? I don't know, but I think that's, you're right. In the first instance, the person who's got to make that imminent harm call is probably the person who's, who's subject to the harm. Okay, I want to be fair to others. I'm, I'm going to go back to the original question that I was going to ask. Um, um, we're we're already really far behind in a in a lot of um, like license plates, um, uh, transfer of vehicles. Um, I know at one point licenses, renewal, everything. Um, if this was even begun, the thought of of this thirty days. I mean, is it the state, I, I don't know if this is a question for you, Eric, or where this is going, but we're already so far behind and our computer systems are so antiquated. Um, I'm not really sure how we're doing uh, due, due diligence uh, to the majority of, of uh, citizens um, that th that's fair at all. I don't, you know, I, my question is, is are we even capable of 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 uh, having an answer in three days, let alone thirty days? Yeah, that, that you're right. Uh, that's the information that I have. But you might ask, uh, you know, when Jeff Wallen from BCIC comes in, that might be some information he might have, or or if you have any any uh, federally licensed firearms dealers, FFLs who are coming in, that's questions for they might be able to help you out with as far as uh, how their timing is currently. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. Yep. Okay, uh, Bob and then Tom. Yes, thank you. It seems like we're all kind of like honed in on that 30 days, Madam Chair. Uh, what I was going to do was go directly to the presenter of the amendment and, and ask uh, 
before that 30 day uh, process came in, if there's some initiate the 30 days or just a number that he, he came up with uh, on his own, if that's appropriate. Uh, yeah, sure. So I didn't, I didn't come up with that on my own. And to, um, as I mentioned, and this is before uh, you had uh, joined the committee, Bob, as, uh, um, as a committee, we passed this out in the previous biennium. This was something that this committee had discussed and, and voted to approve. It wasn't a unanimous vote, but it was something we had voted out of committee. And I can dig back through my old notes, but what I did to revisit this was just take what we had passed and ask that to be placed into an amendment. So the, the 30 days is what we had previously passed out. So I didn't want to, you know, I wasn't trying to invent anything fresh. I wasn't trying to, uh, to reinvent the wheel. What I, what I did, what I thought my, my thought process was, uh, this is something that I was, uh, concerned to see stall out. I wanted to see if we could get it moving again. So I just took the exact, I just, I just requested the exact same language that we previously passed. And the, the 30 days was, was in that language. Thanks, Will. Thank you, uh, Tom. Thank you. Um, I might as well stick on topic here with the with the three day thirty day thing, um, Eric. Is the three day uh, transfer between uh, two citizens? I guess you could say, and not an FFL. Um, is that law now? Um. Uh, yes, I think I think it would apply. Yes. If okay. If, if I'm understanding your question right. Yeah. It, it, just uh, uh, um, let me hang on a second. Let me find it here, and maybe I can be a little clearer. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, we want to go to the, the uh, a 30 day uh, waiting period, or we well, some of us not necessarily want to, but. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. And but is is the law now three days w with when a licensed dealer has to fac facilitate the transfer between uh, uh, just two people, a private sale? Uh, yeah, I think so because the, what the uh, the background check, the state background check language, which is the one that applies to as you're pointing out, between two private persons as opposed to a dealer. That says that the licensed dealer who, who agrees to facilitate has to comply with all requirements of state and federal law and conduct the transfer in the same manner as the licensed dealer would have signed the firearm from his or her own inventory. So okay, I think, great. I think the same procedures would apply. Yeah, so, so that wasn't in a bill that was vetoed then. That was, that was, that was passed. So yes, I guess that's right. with that, and, and I know you don't have the answer, and maybe... Uh, maybe Jeff does is I'd be interested to know how many of these uh, types of dealer facilitated transfers were done. Um, and, uh, and the reason I ask that if there's, um, I, I know in Vermont in years past, people buy, sell, trade guns all the time, uh, you know, before this, this was law. And it wouldn't surprise me if there was more firearms in Vermont bought and sold and traded between individuals more than there is bought new through an FFL. So, so with that, it makes, uh, I'm kind of interested in the number of transfers that were done uh, since this law has been uh, put into effect. And because um, I know there's people who are going to look at that three days and think it's, you know, uh, 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 too much. And if, if we went even more than that, that's going to bring even more people into the fold that are going to ignore the law even more. Just my personal opinion. Um, but uh, going down to page five, uh, the healthcare provider has the same meaning. What is the, the uh, definition of healthcare provider under 18 BSA 9432? Uh, I can pull that up for you. It'll just take a moment. 
Yeah, great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. and, and my concern is, uh, well, I'll, I'll wait. Okay, um, so I can read it to you. The, the healthcare provider <clears throat> means a person, partnership, corporation, facility, or institution licensed or certified or authorized by law to provide professional healthcare service in this state to an individual during that individual's medical care, treatment, or confinement. So would somebody... So, so that covers, sounds like it covers like the institution itself. Yeah, I'd say so. So would, would say an uh, orderly, would, would that qualify an orderly to uh, potentially, lack of a better term, turn somebody in? Is, is the definition that broad? Because an orderly is a healthcare professional. Is to me, as soon as I'm hired at the in, 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 uh, hired at the hospital, I'm a healthcare professional. Well, I don't know because it does say licensed, so I don't know if for, or, you know if what okay. level of different healthcare employees have to be licensed and which don't. Uh, I'm okay. not sure. So yeah, so no, that, that, that's great. That sounds like it narrows it up. But okay, uh, the definition does it. Uh, uh, does, does it allude to a mental health license at all? Because uh, a doctor or a, even a nurse in an emergency room in that situation isn't necessarily qualified to make a mental health uh, diagnosis other than go on a hunch. Uh, yeah, I, I'm not an expert in the healthcare specifics of this. I could certainly follow up on that, but I would say that, yes, it does include because uh, it refers to health services, which means activities and functions of a healthcare facility that are directly related to care, treatment, or diagnosis of patients. So, yes, I would say it does include mental health care treatment. Right, and, and that would be my hope, and that it's that whoever is making these um, diagnoses, I guess you could say, would would have uh, some kind of mental health uh, background, other than um, you know, a, again a. a a doctor or a nurse who hasn't got any of that training again, say in an emergency room, but, um, right. and, and I would love, I would love to be able to, uh, I mean, I still want to keep people safe and I certainly don't want to see anybody to get hurt, but, uh, I also don't want people, um, uh, unjustly, um, accused of something either. So, um, and, uh, my next question, da -da -da -da. What, what is the Capital Complex Advisory Committee and who's on that? It is a, um, an existing uh, body that includes commissioners of buildings and general services and several other commissioners, public safety. It includes the Sergeant at Arms. It includes the um, Chief of Police in Montpelier. And it's a, a body that has been charged with examining issues related to security in the Capitol complex. And okay, they, have a, great. Actually, they have a they have a sunset. It's interesting. That it was it was originally supposed to sunset this year, but last year in the Capitol bill, the sunset was extended. So um, they're at, at right now the sunset is July first, two thousand twenty three, I believe. So that's a sunset on the committee itself. Correct. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Um, and other than that, I guess it, uh, just a comment on section four. Um, I, I, I kind of look at this, at the rest of the bill as being pretty narrow as far as uh, what some may call firearm safety. And uh, to me, section four looks more like a standalone bill. Uh, potentially, uh, I, I kind of I mean, the, the term that comes to mind, and I don't mean it derogatory at all, is, is Christmas tree. And, and this is just, to me, just something that's added on uh, just because, and, and, and uh, not that it 
it doesn't warrant some looking at at some point, but I just don't think it goes with the, with the, uh, the topic uh, for the rest of the bill, but thank you. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Thank you, Tom. And, and we could also find out um, if that information is readily available, if this language were not in here, if, if that information is readily, readily available. Um, okay. So um, Bob. I'm sorry, just a quick follow-up question. When, when uh, Will was speaking earlier, he had mentioned that prior to my arrival, they were working on a bill or amendment or whatever was they were working on. Uh, that's where he uh, used the 30 days or whatever. Was that a bill, uh, Will? And if so, what, was there a vote taken on that? And, and what was it? Do you remember? I, I don't remember the vote total. It was a it was a bill, and it was uh, it was voted out of out of this committee um, favorably. And like I said, it certainly, it wasn't unanimous. So I, I would have to go, um, I'd have to go back a few notebooks to, to get those details, but I'm sure actually we could find them online quicker uh, in our old old records. But this, this is, like I said, this was, a, this was a bill we voted out. This language was lifted directly from an old bill. I think it was H610. You're good. I don't, I don't remember the, the vote tally though. <laughs> okay, um, I'm not seeing any other hands. So why don't we take a um, let's take our 15 minute break, and then Eric, after that, I'll have you please um, walk through the the language that also was in a prior bill and. Uh,